What a terrible day in the U.S. stock market with stocks across the board lower. We had 1% plus sell-offs on all four of our key U.S. equity indices. Really, you didn't have very many places to hide. A couple of places were utilities and energy. That was about it. So we're going to go through that data. We're going to go through a lot of sector information from both a dividend growth investing perspective and also from more of a price perspective in tonight's video. We're also going to go back through time on our heat map to look at not just what happened today, but what's happened last week, the previous month, the previous three months, the previous six months, and the previous year to see how right before our eyes we've witnessed a transition in this marketplace. We're going to have our conversations as usual on our 12 grids about some of the macro effects of this market. Today we had a pretty strong employment related uh, report which sent interest rates surging even higher. We ended the day at 4.8% on the 10-year treasury yield, which is basically like 16 or 17 year highs. That was much of the reason why stocks suffered the way that they did here today. So this is an action-packed video. Make sure you check it out. At the end of tonight's video, we're going to talk about a lesser uh, discussed uh, industrial company that's a good dividend growth company that is approaching an attractive range for long-term investors and once again since today was a big sell-off day in the market we're going to talk about selling a cash secured put on it so with that let's go ahead and get started welcome to the market outlook video presented by marketscholars.com I'm your host Brandon Van Z it's October 3rd, 2023. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down below into the description area. Make sure you're signed up for our email distribution list so that way you can be notified whenever we post these videos. Remember, you'll also find which stocks are giving you overbought and oversold cluster signals at the bottom of those emails. And with the healthy sell-off we've been experiencing over the past month, I have no doubt we'll have a lot of oversold cluster signals once again in tonight's email. In addition to that, we're heavy users of X, formerly known as Twitter. My handle is at Brandon Van Z. We really appreciate those of you that click like and repost uh, and uh, comment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, us content creators can actually get paid now by Elon Musk, believe it or not, for that interaction. So uh, you may have wondered in the past if there's any benefit to us whatsoever uh, when we ask you to do that stuff. And of course there is, otherwise we wouldn't ask you to do it. So uh, if that motivates you, great. Uh, otherwise, of course, uh, hopefully it's our content itself that, uh, that comes through and uh, you appreciate it by just clicking a button there for us. So thank you to all of you who continue to do that. In addition to that, we're heavy users of Facebook, and uh, we have a group for the Market Outlook uh, community, I guess you would say, uh, established, and you're welcome to join that, so that way you can talk about some of these topics that we review during these videos. Uh, feel free to uh, jot down that web address you see there in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And I've got our heat map pulled up, and my oh my, what a day it was. Uh, heavy selling day, and uh, it wasn't just in the stock market, but also in the bond market. So, uh, you know, we don't uh, necessarily see that all that regularly, but remember 2022 was a unique year where we saw that quite often, and uh, it's a little bit... Uh, nerve-wracking when we start seeing that once again here in 2023 but today was one of those days lots of red on the board however it wasn't a complete washout type of a day um, you know there was plenty of green in some key areas like utilities and energy now keep in mind utilities have been absolutely destroyed here in the last couple of weeks especially so the fact that they were up today not sure how much i would read into that uh, it could very well just be a dead cat bounce type of a situation where things plunge so dramatically uh, that they needed to kind of uh, right size of the move, so to speak. Energy is a different story. Energy, of course, is a continuation type of a conversation there where oil prices have continued to march higher and higher and higher throughout the year, and many of those oil and gas companies marched higher and higher and higher right with it. So today we had Exxon and Chevron and Conoco all higher uh, in the utility space, even NextEra Energy that, of course, has been in the blast zone uh, for a lot of utility investors over the past week managed to close higher today, uh, as did Southern Company and Duke and some of those other uh, bigger ones there as well. Beyond those two 
areas of energy and utilities, uh, it was really kind of hit and miss in terms of finding any sort of bullish activity. You had a few names here and there, like a Nike ended up going higher today. Uh, we actually covered that stock in our analysis yesterday in our options for long-term investors class. Uh, we didn't vote for it in the end, but it was one of our potential candidates for selling puts on here yesterday. So it's nice to see a little bit of a rebound there. It's been a tough go of things for that company here recently. Uh, we did see some buying in uh, the major telecom companies like Verizon and AT&T. Uh, Verizon uh, has a yield of 8% these days, so uh, we'll see if that's safe or not, but they did recently raise it, so hopefully that's a good sign there. Uh, nonetheless, the market has certainly has some question marks around that, otherwise there wouldn't be an 8% yield present. Nonetheless, today uh, managed to close a little bit higher. Uh, we saw that uh, CME uh, in the financial space was up a little bit today, Intel in the technology space up a touch here today. Handful of those uh, healthcare related names like Thermo Fisher and uh, Danaher uh, up a little bit here today. Some of the other smaller companies like Cardinal Health, that's a dividend aristocrat company some of you might be familiar with. Another aristocrat is uh, uh, Becton Dickinson. Uh, both of those were up here today. So kind of random um, uh, in, the, in the consumer oriented area. We did see that Kimberly Clark, another dividend aristocrat, managed to close higher here today, as did Target. And remember, we have a sold put on Target in in this uh, market outlook category as well. So we were happy to see it held the line here today, uh, despite the rest of the market uh, collapsing around it. Even Dollar General uh, managed to close a bit higher today and things have been going pretty uh, terribly for that particular company lately as well. Some of the railroad companies managed to close higher, UNP, uh, CSX, and Norfolk Southern, uh, all in the green here today. Handful of other um, uh, industrials related names like Boeing and uh, Illinois Tool Works, that's another dividend aristocrat, managed to close a bit higher, as did uh, Dover, another aristocrat there. So, um, you know, it was, it was a bit more of a sporadic day on the bullish side of the equation. I think the story clearly is the selling, not the buying. And so let's turn our attention to that conversation now. And let's get started with the Magnificent Seven, as we are wont to do. And the worst of the Magnificent Seven today, not so magnificent at all, as a matter of fact, was uh, Amazon down 3.66%. Um, not too far behind it was NVIDIA down 2.83%. Microsoft was down 2.61%. Tesla was down 2.02%. Meta slash Facebook was down 1.92%. Alphabet slash Google was down 1.38%. And then the big kahuna Apple uh, fared the best out of the Magnificent Seven today, down a little under 1%. So that was actually considered a good day uh, compared to what could have been the case otherwise. Um, in terms of other areas that suffered here today, uh, financials really took it across the chin. We actually uh, had a review of a couple of financial stocks in my dividend growth investing class earlier today. That was actually a two-hour class. Usually they're not that long, but we had a lot of data and statistics to get through today. So if you missed that class, the recording is now posted. Um, but the financials were out of favor today. Naturally, when stock prices are out of favor, uh, the dividend yields become more attractive. Of course, you got to be careful with that concept because uh, you only want to be buying stocks that are in downtrends if you trust that the dividends won't be cut. And of course, that has been a larger conversation this year as well. But many of those financials really struggling today. American Express down about 3%. Uh, S&P Global was down about 3%. Morgan Stanley was down about 3%. Goldman was actually down 4%. Wow, I didn't notice that uh, until now. Uh, that was a pretty ugly day. That, that stock usually doesn't move like that. Uh, Schwab has had some very volatile days this year. It was down 4% today. Bank of America down 3%. Now it's back to where it was trading back in the March regional bank crisis. So some of these things are getting a little out of control once again. So we got to keep our eye on what a lot of people refer to as the lifeblood of the market, which is those banks in particular. Um, Eli Lilly was down 2.4% today. Of course, that's one of, been one of the superstar stocks of this year with their weight loss drug, uh, but today was not their day, uh, and today was not the day for Amgen either, down about 2%. Some of the other finance, or healthcare companies, I should say, also finished in the red, including United Healthcare, down about a percent there. Um, and so, 
you know, all in all, uh, clearly it was a, a day to forget <laughs> if you are bullish. Uh, it hasn't been just a day to forget, but some of you saw my, my post here on Twitter a moment ago um, about the just the one month returns of some of the different factors that are out there, whether you're looking at value or momentum or low size or low volatility uh, or quality or dividend yield. It doesn't matter what factor you're in. If you're in the stock market, you're likely down over the last month. Uh, it would be very hard to find anywhere to have avoided um, that type of uh, destruction. Uh, now, maybe there's a few places globally that that would have worked out or perhaps some unique stories in the U.S. like oil companies or something like that. But in general, if you had a, a broad-based portfolio over the past month, chances are high that you are licking your wounds and you're not alone. Uh, there's a lot of us uh, in that uh, camp. So uh, you know that's the way uh, the cookie crumbles there. But it's been uh, an interesting September, that's for sure, as we are now in the month of October. A reminder that oftentimes the first part of October is really ugly. And the second part of October um, sometimes results in a bounce in the market and not just like a, a minor bounce. We're talking about a lot of times um, chaotic uh, markets that are in corrections or bear markets or what have you actually set the low in October. So does that mean that we're there now? Not necessarily. Uh, we'll talk about that here in just a minute, but uh, the VIX is only at 20 right now. Despite all this crazy selling that we've been seeing, uh, the VIX is like not even alive at this point. Uh, so it's it's been interesting to say the least. But um, I was also joking on Twitter earlier today that uh, if we're looking for a day where the stock market might finally, you know, uh, crash and then bottom out. Uh, there is a Friday the 13th this month. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I hope that doesn't come back to haunt me there, uh, having said that. But uh, it has been uh, interesting to see many of these areas, especially the interest rate sensitive areas, uh, getting clobbered here uh, more recently. And again, it's not just a one day phenomenon. Remember on this uh, FinViz uh, version of the heat map, we can go back in time a bit more. So here's the, the one day that we just reviewed, but I could also go back one week. You can see the picture changes a little bit where you have a lot more buying in the technology area over the past week. It's part of the reason the S&P 500 doesn't look like it has collapsed at this point because if we were dominant in some of these other sectors, it probably would look a lot different because as you can see, technology looks good on a one week basis, but the vast majority of the rest of the market looks pretty terrible in just one week. Here's what the one month looks like. Again, not good. In this case, even technology can't bail us out. They look bad over the last month, just like the rest of the market does. There's very few winners over the past month. You've got a couple of oil stocks, those two aristocrats, Chevron and Exxon, both higher. You've got United Healthcare that managed to close a little higher. So some of those, you know, healthcare plan uh, companies did okay. Uh, Costco is up uh, over the last month. Some of you saw my tweet earlier this morning with the uh, uh, the kid that's swinging in front of a. Uh, a chaotic scene of you know buildings burning in the background. So I was joking that the kid swinging was Costco and the buildings in the background were basically every other consumer staples company because as you can see, the consumer staples have been whomped over the last month. Costco is effectively just you know one of the only ones that's up. There's actually one more right here. Kraft Heinz is up just barely. Maybe that's that crunch that's coming out uh, after the whole uh, Taylor Swift, uh, Travis Kelsey thing here recently. But other than those two, every single consumer staples company is down in the S and P 500 over the last month. Some of them down tremendously, including Target. Now remember, we didn't place that trade on selling the put on Target until recently, so we didn't have to suffer the entire brunt of that 14% move there, but nonetheless, that gives you an idea of how badly some of these have traded. Uh, Dollar General's down 19% in this month. Uh, that is almost its own bear market in one single month, right? If you think about that 20% mark there. Um, you even have a stock like Monster Beverage down 10%. That stock has been a monster to the upside over the years, but perhaps now that we're in the month of October, uh, the Halloween spirits are gonna come out and it's a monster to the downside. We've got uh, Estee Lauder down 12%. Remember a lot of times uh, makeup 
uh, holds up pretty well in economically turbulent conditions. Well, this one's not going to be saved. Uh, you have other stocks like uh, Kenview and uh, Clorox also down double-digit percentages during that time period. You have Kellogg. Of course, that company just did its spin-off. So keep in mind that ticker symbol K is actually technically Kelanova now. And they spun off uh, KLG here as the serial division here yesterday. So this doesn't look like it's been updated for that yet. But uh, that is something that uh, we've, we've talked about in some of our classes and things like that. Uh, Smuckers and uh, McCormick both down tremendously as well. In fact, I didn't mention that here specifically, but some of you saw me mention on Twitter that today's worst performing stock in the entire S&P 500 was McCormick. That stock was down like 9%. The Spices Company, right? Uh, you think of a pretty calm, quiet, um, you know, nondescript area of the supermarket that really doesn't make a lot of waves. Yeah, today it was down 9%. So that's the type of market we're in here all of a sudden. Those consumer staples have been hammered. Costco, the rare exception to that. Uh, so things look really ugly here from a one-month perspective in particular. If we look at it from a three-month perspective, things get a little bit better. Notice a few more of those green patches popping in. And then if we look at it from a half a year basis, so in other words, six months, things look fairly good from that perspective. So if we went back a half a year and said, hey, if we could turn back time and invest in the market a half a year ago and hold until today, are we doing okay? It, for the most part, you know, again, it depends partially upon what part of the market you're hanging out in, uh, but certainly you have a decent chance at least in a six month basis. Whereas on a one month basis, forget about it. Uh, you're pretty much down over the last month, almost no matter what. One year ago, here's what it looks like. Sometimes we forget that one year ago, we were in the midst of a massive, massive sell-off, right? Uh, we're kind of short-term oriented when it comes to our memories as humans, but uh, we were in the house of pain a year ago as well. And uh, we ended up setting the low in the month of October, as is often the case. And we've had a tremendous uh, run in the stock market since that time period. So um, it doesn't feel that way because we've been you know, caught up in some of this recency bias where it's felt like uh, there's been nothing but selling here recently, and that is true recently. But if you take a step back and look at things from a grander perspective, you can see that there are lots of stocks up tremendously uh, over the past year, and the vast majority of companies in the market are up from where they were just a year ago. So um, whether you view that as progress or not, I'll, I'll leave it up to you, but at least you know, that's the truth of the situation. All right, uh, let's go ahead and now pop on over here to the main part of the platform. Take a look at some of the specific breadth numbers. Today in the S&P 500, we had 108 stocks that finished in the green, which was good for just a little over 20%, so 21%, somewhere in that general vicinity of stocks closing in the green. Now, if you think about it, that's actually not that bad. Uh, if you got the temperature of you know business television today or even on Twitter or elsewhere, uh, you probably would have guessed that the breadth would have been worse. And I'm not here to say that 21% stocks in the green is good, but um, teamed up with the way that the sentiment felt, uh, it was actually better than I expected when I looked at these numbers here just a little earlier. Um, and I think that's largely due to those two sectors that I had mentioned before. We had a day where we got a dead cap bounce out of the utility sector, and we had a day of continuing strength out of the um, out of the energy sector. Without those two sectors, I think these numbers would have been much, much worse here. So uh, those two kind of bailed us out a little bit here today in that regard. Let's go ahead and pop on over here to the charts now. And remember, whenever we have a day where we either go up or down more than 1%, I like to start our charts conversation with this chart 6D. For those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars, you of course can follow along with your own uh, premium charting package where you have access to the 50 plus customized charts that David and I uh, have here at Market Scholars. Anyway, uh, market was down 1.37% today. And as you can see with this area here in the middle, this is uh, used to kind of judge whether we've had um, volatility recently, whether we have had a lack of it, whether it's kind of been in between. Um, I would say it's kind of been more in between lately. And again, some of you might say, well, what are you talking about, Brad? It feels like we've been getting our heads cut off here lately. And I, I, I get it. I sympathize with you, especially those of you in the areas that uh, I am interested in as a dividend growth investor. It is true that those interest rate sensitive areas have been getting hit a lot worse than, you know, let's say the tech stocks or what have you. But, um, you know, when you look at the size of these bars over here towards the right, 
and then compare them to the size of these bars over here towards the left, this again is a one year, one day chart that we're looking at right now. So each one of these bars represents one day of price activity of the S&P 500. Um, I think we can all agree that the chaos of a year ago was dramatically worse than what we're dealing with right now. Despite how terrible and how bad it feels, uh, it's nothing close to what we were experiencing a year ago. Um, and uh, to prove that point even further, you can see that the VIX, this purple line down below, went up today as it should have, as it was a pretty heavy sell-off day in the market. Remember the VIX and the S&P 500 traditionally are inversely correlated. So when one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. So with the market down pretty good today, no surprise the VIX went up, but it only went up to 19.8 or let's call it 20 just to round. Uh, so the VIX is at 20 right now, that's it. Um, a year ago, we were talking about the VIX up here above 30. That is tremendously different. There was way more fear in the market a year ago. Of course, we were dealing with you know some ongoing effects of COVID and a few other things at that time. But um, you know, it's just to to kind of provide perspective. That's the the beauty of technical analysis and and the study of price and volume and all that kind of stuff is that we get to look at things on a historical standard and compare them to where we're at today. And despite how crazy and volatile it's felt lately, it really hasn't been um, even the worst part of the last year. Uh, so it's not to say it couldn't get there. Uh, it very well might. It's starting to feel that way, right? This market kind of has this uneasy feeling like we're on a slippery slope right now. Even if you look at the price activity up above, you're starting to see a lot more of those red uh, candles starting to be present compared to the black ones up there. And you can see that down below as well. Just look at the, the, the red bars down here versus the green ones. There's been more red than green lately. So it's it's giving us that impression that you know, we're, we're kind of building up to something. And um, like D David was mentioning on his Twitter feed uh, today, we haven't even had a 3% uh, down week here during this move, uh, let alone a 3% um, one day. Uh, we're talking about an entire week where it hasn't been 3%. And usually you're going to need at least something like that at a minimum to have some sort of a washout feeling of the market where it feels like you've shaken out all of the weak hands and then the market can build upon that um, you know, moving forward. We haven't had that type of a moment yet, which is kind of a scary thought because again, it's felt very ugly in certain areas of the market, but for the S&P 500 broadly, which of course is the most important thing for most money managers across the globe, um, we just have not seen that kind of death rattle type of a move yet. Uh, whether it comes or not is anybody's guess, right? We don't have a crystal ball. All we can say is that traditionally in the past, before we can move on and kind of heal, uh, we need some sort of a violent move, movement like that. And we just really haven't seen that yet. So, you know, prepare ye, uh, as the saying goes. Uh, we may have one on the horizon and uh, you're gonna have to do your best to, uh, to get through it. Uh, and hopefully, uh, if you feel like you're all alone in that process, of course, you're welcome to join our uh, program at Market Scholars. Can't guarantee your success, of course, but sometimes misery loves company and uh, we'll all get through it together as opposed to just you being in your basement trading all by yourself and uh, wondering if you're about ready to pull your hair out. Uh, at least we can talk these concepts through and uh, hopefully talk each other off the ledge at, a, at on occasion of, uh, as well. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of our classes uh, do focus on the bearish side of the market uh, uh, as well. Uh, for instance, last week in my factor-based swing trading class, we took a short selling idea, uh, which has already gone to our, um, our, our price target. So, um, you know, and David does a lot of bearish types of stuff and hedging and that kind of stuff in his portfolios as well. So if you're, if you're really nervous that things are going to, you know, fall apart to the downside, there are ways that you can try to kind of mute the, the, the pain. Uh, it's not that you're going to be able to completely take it away because the vast majority of people are far better off when stocks go up than down, but there are some techniques out there that you can kind of try to soften the blow to a degree. Let's take a look at our four grid now and we'll pull that up right here. This is chart 4B for those of you that are following along at home. Naturally, things have not improved <laughs> since uh, we, we last looked at this four grid here um, last week. So, uh, you know, it's been three straight days of selling for the Dow Jones and three straight days of selling for the Russell 2000. Uh, and uh, we are at basically new multi-month lows for the S&P 500. 
despite having a very minor up uh, session yesterday. Uh, but when you have two candles surrounding that up session that look like this and like this, that's, uh, uh, that's not really saying much for that very minor up move that we had yesterday. It was completely washed away easily here today with the sell-off that we experienced. So keep in mind that the postures remain bearish. That is not anything new. We've had bearish postures for a couple of weeks at this point uh, at, a, at the smallest end of the scale. And um, you know, in the case of the Russell 2000, we've had a bearish posture here for basically a month. Uh, right? We, the, the posture shifted from this green background to this pink background on this day right here on uh, September 6th, and today is October 3rd, so we're basically a month into this not just weekly bearish posture, but strongly bearish posture. And we've had some hope that you know maybe some of these oversold conditions could lead to a bounce, but it really hasn't led to much, right? We had a little bit of a two-day rally right here, but it immediately failed on the Russell 2000. And once again, we have an oversold cluster signal on the small caps here tonight. Um, we almost had it on the others. Um, the, the NASDAQ wasn't really that close because the blue line is still pretty elevated. But you'll notice that as we look at the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average, we nearly had a cluster on both of those. We narrowly escaped it. Um, if you want to see that a little bit better, remember you can right click on these charts and then maximize the cell. And that way you can kind of see the indicator a little bit better when it's kind of zoomed in. And notice that that blue line, it's not quite down there in the lower reversal zone, but it's it's knocking on the door of it on the S&P 500. And then if we advance this to the Dow Jones, it was even closer. I mean, spitting distance is how close that was, right? The All three of those colored lines, the red, the blue, and the green need to be below 20 on the same day to have the oversold cluster signal. So of course we had the red line at eight below 20, we had the green line at 12 below 20, but notice that the blue line finished at 20.27. So about as close as you could possibly get for not having an oversold cluster signal. And at one point during the day, the Dow did have a signal, but because we got a little bit of a rally, you can see a little bit of a long lower shadow there, uh, suggesting we didn't close at the lows because we were up and off the lows at the end of the day. It just barely was enough to get that blue line back above the lower reversal zone. But you know, we're kind of splitting hairs there. The, the, the mindset and the psychology of it are the same. These are extremely, extremely oversold types of moments that we're dealing with right now. And just, you know, just take a look at that. Just eyeball that move from where the Dow went to this bearish posture right here on September 18th and where we're at right now. We're not talking about a long period of time, all right? Uh, ever since this day and the days following it, we've only had two up sessions. We had an up session on the Dow on the 25th and then on the 28th, that's it. And then how many red sessions did we have along the way? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So since we went to a bearish posture, we've had two up sessions and nine down sessions. And of those nine down sessions, we had some really ugly, violent moves. Like that is a bad candle right there. That's a bad candle. That's a bad candle. And today was a bad candle, right? They completely offset any good graces from the two uh, bullish candles that we had along the way. This is the this is the blue chip index that we're talking about right here. Now remember, part of the story here with that is because of that interest rate sensitivity, right? Uh, the Dow is not going to have as big of exposure to um, more cyclicals and in in in, in um, you know some of the growth stocks that don't have nearly as much um, you know interest rate sensitivity. Remember, the Dow doesn't own a single utility stock. Uh, the Dow doesn't own a single REIT. Those are the two most interest rate sensitive areas out there. They do own plenty of staples and healthcare and things like that, so they're not completely free of that. But um, you know, it's it's crazy to think that this is the move that the Dow Jones Industrial Average has had in the last two or three weeks, and there are zero REITs or utilities that have caused this. Uh, even though you would think in the top or in the back of your mind that maybe it's the utilities and the REITs that did this to the Dow, no, there are none that did this. Now, maybe there's an indirect relationship, but directly, no, there's no utilities, there's no REITs in the Dow. This is, um, you know, a lot of consumer staples like Coca Cola and those types of companies uh, just getting damaged. They're getting dinged up right now.
So, um, you know, the, uh, the S&P 500, as I mentioned before, is down 1.37% today. The Dow Jones is down 1.29% today. It was actually the best performing index, if you could believe it, uh, still down over a percent, nonetheless down less than the others. Uh, the NASDAQ was the worst today because, you know, some of those stocks like NVIDIA and you know, um, uh, Microsoft really struggling today. So it was down 1.87%. And then um, the Russell 2000 was down 1.69%. And again, Russell is the only one that ended with an oversold cluster signal, but we were within a stone's throw of that on the Dow and the S&P 500. All four of these charts remain, so this is not anything new, it has been for weeks, with a strongly bearish posture, and all four of these charts remain, and this is not new either, below their falling 30-day moving averages. So we have not seen enough improvement yet. Things are still uneasy to the downside, um, no surprise. So let's go ahead and now take a look here uh, over on the internet. I always like to get a chance to say thank you to those of you that help support us with these presentations. Uh, as I always say, as long as we're up and over 100 likes and into the triple digits there, I'll be more than happy to give you a full hour-long presentation, uh, which is more than double the usual amount that you guys would expect out of me, but I want to reward your guys' willingness to click like uh, by giving you extra time. Uh, on the other hand, if you prefer the shorter versions and we're under 100 likes, then we'll just keep it nice and short, under 15 minutes. We'll let you guys decide there collectively. But as I mentioned before, uh, I actually got paid by Twitter here last week. Some of you saw my, my post regarding that. So us content creators can get paid now. So if you're wondering, you know, do you guys get any benefit whatsoever out of me clicking like when, whenever you ask us for that? Yes, we do. We get a benefit out of that. Of course, that's not the reason we do it. Uh, we're not talking about life-changing money here, uh, but it is a nice little perk of operating off of, you know, Twitter as opposed to some of these other areas where we don't get that type of information. I've even had some people in the past tell me that, hey, Brandon, appreciate all the work that you and David do, but I'm not going to get on Twitter because I hate Elon Musk. I say, okay, to each their own, right? Uh, you know, we all have uh, an opportunity to think about uh, things the way that each one of us wants to, uh, no matter how peculiar that may sound to somebody sitting right next to you. But what I would say in that regard is invert then. Uh, if you hate Elon Musk so much, remember it's out of Elon's pocket that I, as a content creator, am getting paid. Uh, so if you want to do damage to Elon, then uh, make him a little poorer uh, because the more that uh, you guys engage on Twitter with content creators, the more money goes out of Elon's pocket into the content creator's pocket. Of course, I'm being a little facetious when I say that, but uh, if you've ever been looking for an excuse to get onto Twitter and previously the reason you didn't is because you hated Elon Musk, well, maybe this is the way to get back to him, uh, get back at him by uh, hurting him in his paycheck or in his pocketbook there uh, by sending it to the rest of us. But in all honesty, we, we really appreciate it. The real reason that we ask you guys to do this is because David and I run a small business. Uh, it is very hard to run a small business and uh, we do not have a major marketing budget and so by having you guys uh, click like and repost and you know comment and all that kind of stuff that's our way of having word-of-mouth advertising many of you are willing to support us because you know that the more you support us the more free content you get out of us uh, and I think that is a uh, a, a good uh, opportunity for both sides both you guys and for us so please keep that up and thank you to the 102 that were willing to take the five seconds out of your day to click like for us the last time around let's go ahead and do some shout outs here thank you to Brandon and to fun Jonesy and to Marty and to Jeff and to Irvin Hot Rod Rob and Kevin and Leah and uh, Common Sense Investing, I think that's Steve, uh, and to Evan and to Teresa and David and Randy and Venky and Rich and David and Lucius and Richie and Neil and Keola and Jim and Judy and Barry and Fragments of Light and Darkness, how about that? Uh, and Susan and Jim and Serene and Robbie and Carlisle and Tammy and Sandeep and NZ and Panda Options Roger, Nick, Pam, William, Karen, Sherry, Jayesh, George, Valerie. The list goes on and on and on. I can't get to all of you because it just chews up too much time, but I, I hope that every so often you hear, you hear your name rattled off because we do appreciate you, uh, each and every one of you that takes the five seconds to do that. All right, let's have another chat here about some of the things going on on our website now. 
and um, most of you know by now if you followed this video for any amount of time that I do a couple of posts uh, in the dividend growth investing category of our blog on our website um, near the end of the month or beginning of the month. And so since we just passed that time period here within the last week, I'll just uh, uh, remind you that uh, those posts can be found. And remember, this is open to all, so it's not behind a, a paywall or anything like that. So there's a few things on our website that we kind of open up as kind of that freemium model where most of our classes and tools and things like that are only for our paying members. But there's a handful of things that you can get for free, just like this Market Outlook video. And one of those things you can get for free is if you hover your mouse over our blog uh, mega menu item and then click on Dividend Growth Investing, you'll see a bunch of posts there. Uh, this one I just posted here um, actually this morning, I did the, the, the graphic last night, but uh, anyway, it's gonna show you which companies raised their dividends um, here in the past month. And you've got some popular companies on there like JP Morgan and Microsoft and Philip Morris and Starbucks and Verizon and others. So feel free to check that out on your own time if you want. And then the other post that I do is this dividend stair step sector statistics. This one I posted over the weekend. And what this is helping us identify is whether we have value opportunities within the market or not. The greater the blue percentage, the greater the chance is that we've seen enough of a sell-off to suggest that there's some opportunities out there. And when it comes to all sectors, so basically up to approximately 700 companies that I cover here, it's actually 665, but um, you know, just to, to let you know, it's a lot of companies. It's not just like a handful like in the Dow or something like that. We're talking about a broad swath of stocks out there. Um, basically half of them, 49% um, over the weekend. And by the way, since we've had selling the last two days, I did check even this afternoon after the market closed and we are officially over 50% of the stocks that I cover on the dividend stair step chart are considered to be in attractive territory right now. As I talked about with our dividend growth investing class earlier today, I'm starting to feel like a kid in a candy store. There are tons of opportunities out there and they're not just scraping the bottom of the barrel types of companies. We're talking about high quality companies. Some of the best companies on planet Earth are on sale here at the moment. So uh, anyway, feel free to dig into that a bit more on your own time there as well. We did cover both of those blog posts in my uh, DGI class earlier today. For those of you that are premium members, if you wanna hear my analysis on them, uh, check out that recording that is now now posted to our trading rooms calendar right here on the mega menu. All right, let's have a chat now about the sector selector, which is not a monthly post, but uh, we oftentimes bring it up here in the Tuesday Market Outlook video because it is a weekly post. So this was updated over the weekend on Friday. And so it's a few days stale by, by now, but can give us an idea of how things are shaking out from a sector perspective. Now remember, this is based upon price. What I was showing you there a second ago um, with the um, dividend growth investing sector statistics, that's a different concept entirely. In fact, it's almost 180 degrees different because typically when prices go down, dividend yields go up. And that's what we were tracking on the other one. This one is driven purely by price. It has nothing to do with dividend yields or fundamentals or anything. Uh, it is how are these sectors doing from a price perspective on a relative basis. One thing I wanted to point out here is one thing you guys heard me specifically point out to you last week and hint at, and luckily I didn't end up with egg on my face when I was suggesting what I did last week, because remember last week we were having the conversation about utilities up here in the number four position, and I told you not to hold your breath on that because from my perspective, that is going to be a very short-lived opportunity there because last week we already had selling in the utilities on Monday and Tuesday. And so judging by what I felt uh, I knew at that time, uh, that there was gonna be a very little chance that utilities would be able to maintain top four positioning. Now, I didn't necessarily know they were gonna fall all the way back to number 10. That was a very dramatic move, but last week was a dramatic um, week for those utilities, in particular NextEra Energy, which is the largest utility stock out there and therefore has the biggest impact on sentiment and things like that. So anyway, utilities had a very, very short time to be in the sunshine and they are back to second to last, just like they were a month ago before they had that little pop higher and right back down. So um, the top three actually remained the same. So while the fourth had a major movement lower, 
rankings one, two, and three, energy, financials, technology, uh, did not budge a, a bit. They, they remained in their same holding pattern right there on a relative basis. Remember, most of these are down over the past month and, and so on, but we're talking about things on a relative basis. So there's always going to be stuff that's down less than others. And so that's what we're ranking here in this case. On the downside, you will see once again, we have our problems with interest rate sensitive sectors and securities. It is a very weird market that we are seeing so much damage in the market, yet the areas that traditionally would do better on a relative basis under previous times when the stock market was getting hit are the exact ones that are at the bottom. That's not normal, right? But that is perhaps the new normal if we continue to go into an environment of higher for longer. In other words, the higher that interest rates continue to climb, the more that you would expect healthcare, real estate, utilities, and consumer staples to continue to do poorly on a relative basis. Now, of course, if you think that eventually uh, something's got to give and the economy is going to start breaking, it's at that point when you would expect the Fed and others to step in lowering interest rates. And if that happens, then you'd probably find that those bottom areas will start doing better on a relative basis. But we're in a really weird moment in time right now where you know um, some of those economic reports are still coming in pretty hot. Like our jobs uh, related number that was uh, bandied about here today was actually uh, part of the reason the market sold off is because uh, you know we saw a big move higher in interest rates when the market realized this market this this economy is not slowing down the stock market is but the economy has not yet slowed down to the point where we're thinking that, hey, maybe, just maybe, we'll get the Fed to, to lower interest rates. If anything, it's the opposite. If anything, uh, the Fed still has a ways to go to stamp out this high inflationary environment that we find ourselves in. And that's not necessarily a great thing for these interest rate sensitive areas like utilities and REITs and what have you. So uh, I found that to be very interesting uh, there as well. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get back on over here to the main part of the platform. And let's do some 12 grid analysis. And we'll get started here uh, with chart 5A. This is our asset class 12 grid. And, um, you know, we've been kind of chatting about the lower corners for a long time. Earlier this year, uh, we kind of relented on that a little bit. But if you'll recall, pretty much all of 2022, we started our conversations with the lower right and the lower left. And the reason for that is those were the culprits. Those were the reasons we had such terrible trading conditions last year. And once again, we find ourselves in those exact positions. Because when treasury yields go up and when the US dollar is strong, the US stock market has a really hard time getting uh, you know, any sort of positive momentum or bullish traction underneath of it. And my oh my, did interest rates erupt today. Again, part of that because of that stronger uh, employment related number that we received today. But um, just to make sure that we're all aware, the 10 year treasury yield is now at 4.8%. Yes, you heard that correctly. And if you're wondering, is that more than just a three-month high that we see on this chart? The answer to that is an unequivocal yes and an emphatic yes. It is way more than three months. In fact, you could go back 10 years. And this is a 10-year high that was hit today on interest rates. And remember, one of the more dramatic things that you've seen over the last few years is the rise in interest rates from next to nothing to something, right? That's part of the reason the market itself is so disturbed is because it wasn't like a gradual move um, to higher interest rates. It was a jolt to higher interest rate and the market was not prepared for that. A lot of portfolio managers are caught off sides when you have such a drastic change in conditions. We were just talking here three or four years ago about the 10-year treasury basically down at like 0.2% or 0.1%. And now we're talking about treasury yields knocking on the door of 5%, not 0.5, but 5%, right? Hundreds, if not thousands of percent higher in, in yields. I know you don't usually quote yields and percentages that way, but just to put that into perspective. So we are at not just three month highs in the 10 year treasury yield, we are at 10 year highs. And we could go back even further than that. If we change our time frame here to 15 years, take that a step further, we're at 15 year highs, not just three month highs, 15 year highs. Now, if I took that one more step further, finally, when we look at the 20 year, uh, we are not at 20 year highs. But hey, we're saying something that 
where we're at in interest rates right now, we would have to go all the way back here to 2007 before the great financial crisis since we've last seen interest rates this high, right? That is a heck of a long time. Many of you were not even trading during that time period, right? Uh, even myself, uh, I was a young whippersnapper at that point. I was only seven years into my trading career uh, in 2007. So uh, I've seen a lot more time pass since then than I had up until that point. So even for me, this is like really, really saying something here to see the interest rates doing what they are doing. And who knows? I mean, who knows where the end is? Right? Like I was joking on, on Twitter there, um, I forget exactly the phrase, but I always think of, um, of the Truman Show. Some of you will, will know what I'm referencing if you like that movie, but uh, this button that that gal uh, wears on the, on the movie, how is it going to end? As I say, bonds and stocks careening lower at the same time. How is it going to end? We all want to know because it's feeling chaotic right now. But you can see we're not that far away from 20-year highs in interest rates. Could we, could we get there? Yeah, at this rate, anything's possible. Look at the consistency of that move to the upside. We're looking at monthly candles here, but we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six months in a row. It has been relentless to the upside. Interest rates rising as we're trying to fight that high inflationary environment, yet people are still paying $500 to go watch U2 at the uh, Sphere in Las Vegas, as you saw some of my videos last weekend as just one random example. But, you know, people are still spending money out there. And that sounds like it's a good thing for people who are consumers and enjoying life and all that kind of stuff. But it's not a good thing for us in the stock market because it basically means Jerome Powell knows his job is not done yet. That's a scary thought because uh, we just went through an epic rise in interest rates and we're within a stone's throw of 20-year highs. It would not be out of uh, the ordinary for us to be able to breach that given the pace of interest rate rising that we are witnessing in the midst of right now. So let's keep our eye on that possibility, but we're talking about interest rates higher right now than probably most of you have been even involved in the financial markets. And that is a big problem for the stock market. Earlier this year, it was interesting because it felt like the stock market didn't care so much. Remember, last year it did. Last year was a terrible year for the stock market uh, as we actually were down more than 20% from the highs uh, on the S&P 500. The NASDAQ was down 33%. So, you know, last year was a terrible year for the market. And a lot of the reason behind that is because the market was concerned with rising interest rates. But interestingly enough, earlier this year in 2023, we went through a brief period of time where it seemed like the market didn't really care. It's, it was kind of like trying to feel it out as to whether we were near the end or not. Um, but I think as the summer rolled along, I think the market realized, yeah, we're, we're starting to get our answer. We're not near the end and we have to adjust accordingly. And now we're seeing that pretty aggressive sell-off in stocks as a result of that. And again, it's not just the 10-year treasury yield that is a problem for the market right now. It's also the US dollar. The dollar hit another multi-month high. Now with the dollar, we're not talking about 17-year highs like we are uh, with the 10-year treasury yield, but we are talking about uh, multi-month highs at a minimum for the dollar, and that doesn't help at all either. Remember, there's a lot of multinationals like Coca-Cola and McDonald's and Nike and these companies that do business all over the globe, they don't want to see the dollar strong. Right? If you're going on a trip to Europe or something like that, great, have at it. You've got a strong dollar, you can spend a lot more money overseas. But if you're an investor in U.S. stocks, you generally do not want a strong dollar. And that is yet another headwind that we're dealing with right now. And my oh my, is it ever damaging gold? Holy mackerel, gold is just falling apart right now. Take a look at that. I'm very thankful um, we were able to get out of you know, that, uh, that uh, what was it, an iron condor, I think is what we had in the, in the previous month's expiration cycle. Because had we um, had that for the October monthly expiration instead of September, we would have gotten run over on that particular trade. So sometimes better to be lucky than good. But this has been really out of control to the downside for gold. In fact, gold has had a couple of oversold, in fact, three oversold cluster signals in a row the last three trading days. It was down yet again here today. And you can see the separation between where it's trading and its 30-day moving average is the is the deepest separation between those two along the way. So 
are we ready for a little bit of a snapback rally? I'd say so. Uh, but then again, I'd probably said that a week ago as well. And yet uh, here we are with how many days in a row to the downside? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days in a row to the downside for gold. I mean, that's a bloodletting right there. That is ugly. Strongly bearish posture, still below falling 30-day moving average. Thankfully, oil has not been nearly as bad. So it's not that many folks have a portfolio that is, you know, chucked or filled to the gills with with oil companies. But even if you have a small allocation towards oil companies, whether you're dealing with kind of the big boys of Chevron or Exxon or something more speculative, a little bit lower in this in the in the in the risk curve, um, you know, you're you're probably holding up better than people who refuse to invest in oil, right? And there are people like that out there. There are some people that say, I'm never gonna buy an oil stock because I think they're the they're the most evil corporations. They're destroying the world and you know this, that, and the other thing. Well, that's fine. Everybody's got their opinion on that topic as well. Uh, but what I can say is if you've had some oil stocks in your portfolio over the last three months when oil has gone up like this chart is showing us, you've held in there perhaps a bit better than people um, who don't have those oil companies in their similar types of portfolios. So oil, thankfully, has not been you know, harmed too dramatically from that ever-rising US dollar the way that gold has. Uh, you can see that Bitcoin is uh, the other green chart that we have on the board. I wouldn't rant and rave about it, uh, not nearly as aggressive of an up move as we see with the three green charts on the bottom rung. Nonetheless, it's worth at least pointing out that uh, Bitcoin is up at 27,000 again. Of course, Sam Bankman Freed apparently is in court at the moment. So perhaps a, a few more people thinking about cryptocurrencies here at the moment. But all of a sudden, Bitcoin is above its rising 30 day moving average. We haven't been able to say that since back here at the end of uh, July. So it was a pretty ugly you know, September for Bitcoin, but you are getting a nice little rally here more recently. So we'll see if we can build upon that. Uh, of course, the bonds just got annihilated today, right? We should expect that on a day when interest rates just basically went bananas to the upside. Those are days when bonds are going to get destroyed. And like I mentioned there uh, on uh, Twitter, you know, it's kind of interesting because we, we sometimes we get so caught up in the day-to-day -day activity, we don't take a step back and look at what has happened um, on, a, on a further back period of time. And like I mentioned here, long-term U.S. Treasury bonds through the proxy of the ETF TLT is down more than 50% from its highs just three years ago. It was up at 179.70 three years ago and has collapsed to $85. And remember, that is oftentimes perceived as a safer corner of the market. But of course, when you're talking about long duration assets like you know these long-term treasuries, all bets are off, right? The, the shorter term treasuries have held in there a lot better. Not to say that they've had, had a great experience either, but their returns have not been anything nearly as disastrous as long-term US treasuries. So it has been interesting to watch that play out as well and talk about a catalyst here today TLT was down over 2% today. That is an ugly looking candle. You basically close at the low of the session and you have an oversold cluster signal once again. Uh, foreign bonds were down 0.34% and high yield bonds were down just over 1% there. That was another uh, kind of you know eye-popping move that I've seen recently. Those have been three really ugly days out of uh, high yield bonds. Uh, they looked okay on Thursday last week, right? We were talking about that bullish engulfing. Well, that failed in a hurry uh, because we just saw a, a rug pull in high yield bonds after that. Remember, that is a, uh, a way that you can take the temperature of risk appetite. So it's another way of saying market participants don't want to have anything to do with risk appetite right now. Forget about it. Down to the downside, uh, having your oversold cluster signal on all three of those bond categories here today. So maybe we get some sort of a reversion to the mean type of move. But as I always say, don't trust those moves until they can get above their moving averages for an extended period of time. Otherwise, they are just kind of quick little dead cat bounce types of situations. You got to be very careful with those. Um, by the way, preferred stocks got blasted today as well. They were down about 2%, formed their own oversold cluster signal. Remember, a lot of preferred stocks do trade like bonds, and so that correlation appears to be alive and well. And then with the strength in the US dollar, no surprise, foreign stocks got killed today as well. They were down anywhere between 1.25% and 1.32%. So basically in line with the selling in the US markets and both of those foreign areas, EEM and EFA, both ended with an oversold cluster signal today as well. 
Let's take a look at our sector 12 grid now. And uh, no surprise, when we look at most of these charts being pink, the only exception is communications. And even that, I would venture to guess, is probably heading for a pink chart as soon as tomorrow if we get another day of selling. Now, I don't know that to be the case, but what I can say is that this is likely very, very touch and go here. In fact, let's do this. Let's right click, maximize the cell, and you can see basically what plots the color of the background is what direction this green line is going. So technically, the green line today is slightly higher than where the green line was yesterday, but it is minuscule. I mean, you can barely even make it out with your naked eye. So in other words, we get another day like we saw today on communications where we were down over 1%. If we get that tomorrow, it's almost a shoe in that that green line rolls over tomorrow. So, you know, um, careful with reading too much into that green background color on XLC at the moment. It's kind of a, just a fluke is the way that I would look at it. As you look at all the rest of the charts, they are as you would pretty much expect, ugly, right? Pretty much across the board. In the past, we were saying, well, at least we got energy above its moving average. Well, we can't even make that claim anymore. With three days in a row of selling with XLE, we're back below the moving average. Moving average rising, which is why it's yellow, price below a rising moving average, but um, you get a few more sell-off days there and that'll change too, right? So um, that was our one bastion of health in the market and we're slowly even losing that last one right there, right? The other charts just look disastrous, right? Um, you got real estate, fresh three-month lows oversold cluster signal here today. Utilities had three month lows, but as I mentioned before, they actually rallied today. Uh, utilities were the only sector that closed in the green and they actually had a good day, but they were up 1% after you know an absolute collapse in the last two weeks. So let's not read too much into that. That's more of a dead cat bounce philosophy for all we know at this moment. But um, at least, hey, it didn't continue to sell off. I guess there's always that. Uh, but um, before they rallied here in the afternoon today, they did touch a new three month low in the morning part of the session. We had a three month closing low on Staples. They also had an oversold cluster signal. So tonight's uh, email, uh, you're probably gonna find a lot of stocks that are in financials, industrials, staples, and real estate in the uh, oversold cluster portion of the email at the bottom because those sectors have their own oversold cluster signals. Um, you can also see that healthcare uh, hit a new three month low today. Materials hit a three month low today. Industrials hit a three month low today. Financials hit a three month low today. Discretionary hit a three month closing low today. Uh, and the market itself hit a three month low today. So, you know, despite the breadth not being awful today, this was still a very, very bad day in the stock market. Uh, there, make no bones about it. This was not what you want to see if you want markets to stabilize. Uh, this is par for the course of what has been the case since basically the beginning of September, selling upon more selling upon more selling with no end in sight. So it's ugly out there for sure. All right, let's go ahead and, oh, and by the way, uh, I told you what the, the best performing sector was today. It was the utilities, the worst performing sector today. I think it was discretionary. Yeah, it looks like it was discretionary down 2.43%. Remember, that's because of the Amazon effect there. This is the um, market cap weighted sector ETF here. So Amazon has a much bigger weighting. So a big chunk of that move is due to the um, terrible trading out of Amazon today. All right, let's get into our trade application example now. And so most of you know my routine by now. Um, and if you're newer and you don't, uh, let me just repeat it. If it is a Tuesday or a Thursday when I'm scheduled to do the video, and by the way, I should make this comment as well since I haven't mentioned it here. I've mentioned it in my, my premium classes, but uh, I know not all of you are premium members. You're just watching the free videos here. I will not be here on Thursday. Uh, my kid has a, uh, a fall break for Thursday and Friday, so we're gonna try to get a, a quick little out of town trip in. Uh, so I'm not gonna be here on Thursday when I normally would be doing the video. So there will not be a video on Thursday. I will be back by next Tuesday. And so so I will be doing this video again for you next Tuesday, but then the Thursday after that, I will also be off because my brother and his wife are coming to town and want to do my best to, to be a good host to them and, and take them around town and things like that. So the next two Thursdays, no video, just be aware of that. Um, but 
Typically, when it's a Tuesday or a Thursday and I'm scheduled to do the video, if the stock market is down more than 1%, that is a day where you should anticipate that my trade application example in the video, assuming we're up over 100 likes, of course, uh, will be a sold put trade idea. Uh, I like to sell puts on days when the market is getting hammered on high quality companies because we get more bang for our buck when we do that, right? Volatility is rising, so that portion of the, um, the, the options pricing model is juiced and of course if you want to buy the question the company in question at lower prices anyway it's an incentive to basically say hey I'm willing to buy the stock at a lower price the way that you would if you were let's say just putting in an open good till cancel buy order uh, but instead you get paid to do that right so that's the benefit you get when you're selling puts you're getting credits up front so let me show you what we will be doing today and the stock in question is ticker symbol HON. This is Honeywell. And as you can see on this 10-year chart, Honeywell has sold off pretty aggressively in recent weeks with the rest of the market to the point where you've got this little green dot showing up below the bar of this week's chart, meaning that you have an oversold weekly cluster using the market forecast on this particular security, Honeywell, of course, a well-known industrial, especially here in the United States. Now, unlike the Target one that I showed you previously, Target was already in the blue zone, so it was much, much more aggressively sold off. Honeywell has actually held up a bit better. It hasn't made, been making big waves up or down. So right now, it actually would not be a viable candidate under my long-term investing rules until it got down into this blue zone. So selling a put can help facilitate that mindset because when you sell a put, the way that we do it at least is sell out of the money strike. So we select a strike price in the options chain that we'd be willing to buy 100 shares of that stock at. And then we sell that put. Well, in today's case, for those of you that are premium members of Market Scholars, you of course already received my trade alert uh, through the Telegram uh, private channel that we have. And you'll know that I sold the 165 puts in the month of September. 165 is approximately right where you see this blue line right down below here. And I was able to get basically 1% return on risk of that, which is what I oftentimes shoot for. Well, the, the nice benefit of that particular level is, first of all, you can see that this kind of plateauing dividend stair step area is almost exactly at 165. In fact, it's at 165.46. But the little bonus that comes with this is many of you might have noticed when we were looking at that um, post over here that Honeywell actually just raised their dividend by 5% here in uh, the last week or so. And there's a little bit of a weird glitch on the Thinkorswim platform where um, there's kind of a, a, a delay or um, you know a, a grace period, as it were, between when a company announces their new increase in the dividend and when it actually gets plotted on the charts. Um, the graph is going to work off of a um, X date, not on a declaration date. So Honeywell has already declared their increased dividend by more than 5% on their next payment yet we have not yet crossed into the X date of that dividend. So that's why here you're seeing this kind of pop higher off to the right of where the, the bars are is because the X date is in the future. We haven't yet crossed that. So the new level, and this will be adjusted on this label up here as well after we cross that X date, is gonna be up here act actually closer to like 174. So it's kind of a bonus because we're willing to buy it down here at 165, which was last year's level, even though this year we might be willing to buy it at around 174 because Honeywell is a company that usually does not have very high dividend yields and for it specifically, usually uh, it is a ample opportunity when it's yielding 2.49% or more. You can see that Honeywell's earnings have held up reasonably well. Um, you don't have as much interest rate sensitivity with this one. You do have an economic sensitivity to it, but not interest rate sensitivity. And therefore, with earnings holding up, you've seen a decline in the P.E. ratio where it's below 20 times earnings at the moment as well, which isn't dirt cheap, but is definitely on the cheaper end of the scale compared to where it's been in the last couple of uh, years here. So anyway, that was the trade idea for the day selling a cash secured put 
on Honeywell at the 165 strike in the month of November. Uh, you only want to do trades like this if you're willing to be an owner of Honeywell at $165. Otherwise, it's probably not worth it for you to consider this type of a trade. Of course, in the end, we're not your advisor, so we can't tell you what to do or what not to do with your money. But uh, just a friendly reminder from an educational perspective that there's plenty of risk in these put selling ideas out there. So you want to make sure that you're only selling puts on companies that you admire, that you'd be willing to be a buyer of for the long term. And I think Honeywell probably fits that mode for a lot of people. The other thing I was going to mention is that 165 right here is approximately where you saw that double bottom out of Honeywell last year in 2022, right here in uh, July, and then also right here in September. So maybe from a technical analysis perspective, there would be interested buyers at that level. You also have a bit of that concept of old resistance becoming new support at that level. You can see back here in 2018, it went up to about 165, and it did so right over here in uh, January of 2018 as well. So that was kind of like a double top at around that level in 2018. 2018, and then you got a bit of a double bottom at that level with that concept of old resistance becoming new support, and maybe that could come into play with this trade setup here as well. Okay, so that's what I had for you. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. It certainly wasn't a very fun day in the stock market, I can tell you that. But uh, if you uh, prefer these longer form videos where it allows us to kind of air out these topics and do a bit more analysis with our 12 grids and all that kind of fun stuff, uh, I have one simple request for you. Simply click like for me there on Twitter. Remember, it'll be pinned to the top of my timeline. Otherwise, you can find the little tweeting question underneath the video that you're watching on our Market Scholars website. You can also find it in the description area of the YouTube video itself. And you can also find it in that Twitter icon on the email. So four different ways make it nice and easy for you to uh, participate in that and help support David and I uh, with these presentations. But again, I'm gonna be out of town on Thursday, so no video there. But if we're up and over 100 likes by the time we do the video next Tuesday, I'll give you another hour long session on that day. So we'll let you guys decide. Whatever it is that you do to decide, I appreciate you checking out tonight's video. I wish you all the best success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.